Okay. Hey, it is five o'clock. We are live again. Happy Monday. This is week two, um, nibble number two, I guess you could say. Um, for AP Live, AP Computer Science A, we are cycling back and we're going to look at uh, methods and control structures and uh, classes and arrays and array lists and 2D arrays all over again. So we're going to recap some of the things we talked about um, last week and talk about some new things this week. Yeah, plus um, inheritance, plus recursion. And inheritance and recursion. I'm Rob Schultz. I'm Jill Westerland, and we are so glad that you're with us, joining our friends all around the world. Check it out. We've got some more um, pins on our map now. Too slow. That's there we okay. Go. It's just Monday. We're still tired. So um, we are like stretching ourselves around. So I hope you feel encouraged by the fact that there are many of you practicing Java code and preparing for CSA exams. Um, coast to coast, um, east to west, north to south. Worldwide. That's right. Okay, well, we um, we are here again to help you prep, and we wanted to first um, start off by looking into our quack back bag um, mm -hmm. at some of the things that we've gotten, some some really good questions. Um, so I'll, I'll kick us off with the first one, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, is it okay, and I'm assuming this means in a free response question, but is it okay to use a different parameter name than what was written in the method to write the signature? If we rewrite the signature at the top of the answer sheet using a shorter parameter name. And I'm going to kind of qualify this and say it kind of depends on the free response question. Um, questions one, three, and four, typically, um, if, if you are given specific method names to use, you're given a class definition where the method names are already written out, the method signatures, including the parameters and return types. And if that's the case, you have to use what's written. You can't change it. And we're going to do an example today. When we look at today's free response question, um, I'll, I'll kind of cycle back to this and answer. Um, anything that's pre-written in the problem description, you have to use as is. You can't go back and rewrite. But if it's question two, where you're writing a class from top to bottom, um, it doesn't really matter what you call the specific uh, the specific parameters as long as it's not stated somewhere in the problem description that you have to use specific names. So if it just says that you pass in two ints, then you can call them int1 and int2 or value1, value2, as long as you're meeting the parameter requirements that, that's given. But I guess the easiest thing to answer would be to read the project description very carefully. If there is anything specifically given um, in a specific font, and I'll point that out when we get to today's free response question, then you have to use it as written. You can't shorten method names or parameter names or, or anything like that any more than you could change the return type. So, so okay. I'm raising my hand in our Zoom. Um, is it possible, I think it would be, for students to have a pencil, a pen. I mean, I know they're, they're told to write their responses in pencil if you're doing the May 6th exam, but a highlighter. Can they go through and highlight? I, I think it specifically says in there somewhere because I did look it up. I had a student last year that was very into marking things with colored right. pencils and it was brilliant. Um, the way they, they marked certain things with certain covers, colors so they could identify variables and methods and all that. Um, and I think it specifically says, and I, I would have to double check this. So, so please students yeah. and teachers that are watching, don't hold me to this, but I think it specifically says in there somewhere that you are not to use colored pencils or highlighters. I meant um, in their booklet. Like, I don't yeah, know. I, no, I, I think that's the like case. the AP coordinator is not going to let you have a highlighter. Yeah, I, I don't think your you're allowed to have one. Yeah, but, I think that uh, makes but, sense. But I would double check that. Please. Double I've check never that with given it like I normally give students a pencil and maybe a piece of right. candy or something in case they, you know, have a tickle in their throat. Yeah. I've never given out highlighters. I've never known anything about highlighters, but it yeah, came to my I, mind. So I, I typically do a pencil. There was one year where I had rubber duck erasers. Yeah. Um, and, and I typically pick up donuts from our local donut place and yeah. have donuts for them in the morning too. So yeah. So a um, happy bag for AP day, yeah. but don't plan on the highlighters y'all. So, yeah. um, you know, what we do in our normal Day -day. I'll, I'll try and double check that this evening so I can clarify <laughs> on that tomorrow to tell you one way or the other. But I, I think I remember reading in there somewhere that you can't do that. Yeah, it doesn't sound like something any of us do. OK, yeah. question okay. two. Is it good to write comments on the free response portion? I'm going to say probably not. It's wasting your time because um, they're going to be scoring your code. So, I, I mean, I guess you could like think out loud on your page but the score the reader is going to be scoring your code and if even if your comment explains what you did but it's something that's prohibited in the scoring 
I don't know that they're going to be able to go around it. So, Mr. Schultz, what yeah. do you say about all that? No, I, I would tend to agree thing. with that. Um, you know, I, I, I can't think of a place where, um, from a timing standpoint, it would be, it would be beneficial to put comments. Um, you know, the, the readers are, are fluent enough with Java code that there isn't really going to be anything that you're going to write code wise that you're going to have to explain They're They're going to get that part. Um, and you also have to kind of be careful. Remember we talked last week about the fact that if you write extraneous code that causes a side effect, if you, if you're writing a comment, um, and maybe you forget the comment marker or something, um, you know, the, the comment slashes, um, you know, you have to be careful because extraneous code that causes a side effect can, can cost you a point. So, um, so, I mean, unless there's a really, really specific reason that you would need to add a comment to your code, I don't know that I would put the time into it. Yeah, and you only have, remember, 22.5 minutes per free response question, and you may need 30 minutes for questions three and four. So that means you've got to borrow eight minutes from questions one and two. You know, that might be a good way for you to plan your time, you know, is I'm going to use, you know, whatever it would be, um, 14 minutes or something on the first couple or whatever the math is. Yeah. Um, and then 30 minutes and 30 on the, the last two. And if you get finished early, check back over anything. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Are we going over inheritance of polymorphism? And yes, we are. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about ducks, ducks, ducks. And um, we're going to talk about objects and many forms of ducks and a case study. Yes, we have ours. And um, you might have a duck that, you just have or that your teacher gave you or you can go out and make yourself an origami duck um, between today and tomorrow or you can just have a pseudo duck that exists only in your imagination and that's completely fine too because um, we're going to be talking about inheritance and a little case study about ducks tomorrow all right is a zero considered a positive integer on the ap exam i'm gonna let mr schultz answer this um, I would say no. Um, I, I think anytime you use zero, zero is considered neither positive nor negative. So, I mean, by definition, this is the math teacher in me, a positive number is a number that's greater than zero and a negative number is a number that's less than zero. So if you are asked specifically for a positive integer, it should be something greater than zero. And num um, the uh, go ahead. multiple choice will normally tell you something is an integer greater than zero or something yeah. is an integer greater than or equal to one. So watch for a disclaimer in multiple choice, but yeah, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, and also the thing that pops up every once in a while, um, I'll have students in my own class that ask, is zero even or odd? Well, remember an even number is any number that's evenly the divisible by zero. In other words, when we call modulus, it returns zero. And so if I, if I divide zero by two, um, I'm going to get zero as the remainder. So zero is technically, I would say, considered an even number. That's a good okay. point. Yeah. I think there's right. one more, right? Uh, yeah. Yep, one more. What chapters or units will be covered on the AP exam? Will it be like last year? No, no, no. It is we not going to be like last this year. Enough. Yeah. Throw that out the window with the rest of what was irritating about last year. The, the um, 2020 exam was an anomaly. It was an outlier. It was it was 2020. Um, and that was a one time thing. So, yeah, yeah. you are going to be tested on units one through 10 in their entirety. Um, you will have four free response questions of four different types. And we're going to conclude today kind of talking about that again. Um, question types on free response, um, but you are responsible for the entirety of the course and exam description. So I'll try to remind you of that in a couple of ways today as well. So yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So thanks for all the questions. Again, keep sending the questions to us. We yeah, love we've getting got the three questions. more days. And and don't forget, um, go back and look at. Tuesday of last week if you haven't seen it already, and make sure you're sending us your your object. Uh, your, your instantiation of your person objects so that we can add you to our map. Yeah, nice. So today we're going over methods and control structures and we're gonna do multiple choice content review. And then we're gonna look at the 2019 question number one AP calendar. So that's kind of what we're doing today. Um, you know, big picture item and um, the skills. And I'm gonna show you those in just a minute. Oh, we had an extra, there we go. Yeah. 
So we're on iteration number two. And here is our bit of the day. Our bit of the day, and we're all the way over here at two to the four. Um, how can you use AP Daily and AP Classroom for exam prep? And so what I'm going to do is I have got AP Classroom pulled up. And if you're a teacher and you're watching, you'll be excited to know that we now have something called the demo class. In addition to the classes that you teach at your local school, you now have a demo class and there are demo students in the demo class. And I was excited that one of them was named Gladys because I call myself Gladys at my house because there's a old TV show that had a nosy neighbor named Gladys. And so I call myself that. And if you're young and you're watching this, um, the show that had Gladys, the nosy neighbor, also had Aunt Agnes. And they tell me that there's some kind of Wanda something with an with an Agnes. So you all know what I'm talking about. I don't know anything about Agnes other than Aunt Agnes. Rob knows. For, for copyright reasons, we're probably better just to leave it at that. That's right. So, it's yeah. all anyway. incognito <laughs> right there. So um, I'm Gladys at the moment, and this is AP Classroom Student View. So I, and that's another thing, teachers, you can now view AP Classroom as a student. So if you haven't looked at AP Classroom lately, um, there's some new features that we can be really thankful for. So students in AP Classroom, you can get to all the units and all the videos. And I wanted to connect a couple of dots. When you're looking, so like I've chosen... If you just go to course, you're going to get all the faculty lectures, which you may have watched those already. If you haven't, you should. Um, and then I'm going to go into unit two. Today, we're focusing on units two, three, and four. So I'm going to show you that. Remember us talking each day about the skills that you're being assessed on in the course? That's these same skills from page, um, I think it's 19, of the course and exam description. And there's a daily video for each one, but I want to talk for a minute about topics. You got topic one, topic two. So this is actually unit two, topic one. So we would call that 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. Where can I find out more information about these topics? That would be in the course and exam description. It is on AP Classroom. No, it's on AP Central CSA pages. It is also in our shared resources folder. I've given you the big green binder PDF format for the um, the course. So if you want to just like read through everything that topic two says, you would go to topic two in the course and exam binder. And you might can see behind me over here, I've got the green binder. Um, it, the teacher version um, paperback is pretty large. So, so that may not be a waste of your time. Um, there it goes. Mr. Yep, Schultz has got it mine. pulled up. Um, yep. I have a vocabulary set that I made by going through every single topic in order. And I'm gonna put that also out in the shared folder today. Um, if you wanted to print that or look at it and just kind of go through, do I know what this means? Every concept that comes up in the course, I've included in this big old set of vocabulary terms and concepts. Um, you know, it just if you have time, I know that many of y'all are taking six and eight AP classes and you've got to manage, you know, what's about to start next Monday. So I don't want to cause you stress, but you can get to a lot. You cannot get to assessments that your teacher has not already assigned to you, um, but you should ask your teacher to assign you some like you've got another, you know, week and a half. If you're taking the May 6th exam, you've got you know, three weeks at least if you're taking May 18th and you've got, you know, a little bit over a month if you're taking the June 1st, ask your local teacher to assign you progress checks, uh, practice exams, um, be an advocate for your own instruction. So um, you can grab it back now, Mr. Schultz, and okay. we will carry on with what skills we're looking at today. But now's the time for you to say, um, you know, I'm getting prepared. Show me what to do. Uh, let's see. Um, we are looking at the helper screen thing. You know that. That. Which like one? Un, you may have to unshare and then reshare. We're looking at your whatever that thing is that PowerPoint gives you where it shows you the next slide. Oh, whoops. Am I giving you the wrong one? Yeah. I picked the wrong one. That's okay. 
Okay, let's see. That, that thing kind of drives me nuts. Yeah, I was Not, I was scrolling through the slides and I was go. like, okay, what's she talking now, about? Okay, y'all are going to be excited today with the multiple choice. Um, no, go ahead, go back up one. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, there, I did want to show y'all this. Um, we've kind of swapped since we're on week two to columns four and five. So we're looking to be looking at questions today that involve test cases, code segments, um, and then two things from column five. We may dip back our toes back over into one and two, but this week will mostly be on the skills in multiple choice that relate to columns four and five. Um, and again, those are the little tags that, that line up in AP Classroom mm -hmm. so that you can kind of school yourself. And teachers, you can build quizzes just on certain skills. So, um, you know, become really good friends with AP Classroom. It is wonderful. All right, question number one. I think y'all are going to be excited about the multiple choice from some of you who have, you know, in the past been like, help us more. So this is vehicle classification, and I had to make it on three slides to, to kind of do it the way that I wanted to do it. Um, vehicles are classified based on their total interior volume. So how much space, how many cubic feet do they have inside? So um, this is a selection question um, from unit three. And you can already tell that we've got to have how many ways of selection? Minivan, subcompact, compact, midsize, large. We got to have five ways selection here. So I think you can go forward a click or two. Okay. Um, we're going to plug in a volume. So the method's going to receive a parameter volume and then or and it's going to return a value based on how much volume the car has. So you can kind of roll that forward. So first we're going to do our if, then if else, then if else, or else if, else if, and then finally an else. Um, with selection like this, notice how the chart reads. Many compact, less than 85 cubic feet is the top line of the table you're given. But when you go to code this, you want to start with the largest value. When you're pouring things in for selection, we want to sort out our 120 cubic feet um, equal to or greater than 120 first. And then if it doesn't meet that criteria, then we bump down to 110 to 119 and so forth and so on. So don't be turned around by the way a table's presented to you. Think like a coder. Um, whenever you're doing selection, you want to pour in your largest value. Um, let that be sort sifted out first, I guess, if you're thinking about like, you know, I'm in the gold rush and I'm going to sift out gold nuggets. All right. So the next one will show you kind of what the question looks like. The code does not work as intended. So we're going to let this sit for just, you know, I don't know, 10 seconds. You'll have to pause or watch again and pause probably. There's a glitch in the selection, obviously, if it doesn't work as intended. The question is going to ask you which um, which number does not yield an output? So one of these things, um, large, mid-size, compact, is not going to be put out as a result as it is supposed to. This will be another good thing for you to code um, in all your spare time. Okay, so now we go to the third slide and you'll see the actual answer choices with the code. And the answers, of course, are in our resources folder. Okay, the next three questions are all Boolean expressions. And um, they give you a compound, you know, like think about English compound complex sentences. We've got compound Boolean expressions, you know, one Boolean expression being evaluated as to its equality with the other Boolean expression. Um, these are questions that are best solved with a truth table. You may be able to do a truth table in your head. Um, what I'm going to do here on these, I want to show you the question here. It's asking you um, which of the following best describes the conditions under which the expression you see will evaluate to true. So I'm going to show you in table graphic format how to kind of break this down. So we'll just kind of go through. Here's a larger um, version of the exact algorithm. Well, I don't know if it's an algorithm. I guess it's an expression. Here's how you could set up a truth table. We're evaluating on the left side and, or A and, B or not A. 
So if you roll through like one click, I would fill in A and B first with the typical way that you might fill in a truth table. Then I would go ahead and fill in my not A column by just doing the opposite of what A was. Then I would get my A or B result to fill in the parentheses section on the right. And now I'm ready to do the and portion. And remember, when you're looking at a relationship, if it is an and relationship, both conditions must be true in order for true to be the result. An or relationship, either one of them can be true. And then for the other side, you're really just doing A and regular, A and B regular. So that might help you think about that. You can come back and pause the video um, as you kind of break it down. And there are some great sites that, that help you also evaluate truth tables. What? Can I, I was just going to say yeah. one of the one of the common mistakes that my own students make is they they get into this habit of thinking that they have to just be the same. So they would evaluate an and as, you know, both of them being not just true, but both of them being the same. And so I wanted to stress that, that they both have to be true. It, it doesn't matter if they're both false. They have to both be true in order for the whole thing to be true. That's right. And, okay. and think about it like this. We call them truth tables. So we're seeking truth. We're trying to see if there's a, a situation under with truth under which truth can win. That's kind of how I think about it in my, you know, brain. All right. And then the next, um, well, here's the actual question. Um, under which best describes when it will evaluate to true. So you'll kind of have to probably come back and pause um, or you may have already picked up on it. All right. The next one is a little bit simpler. Which best describes the value of the expression shown below. So the expression's a little simpler. And again, we have a table to help you kind of organize your thoughts. I think you can do like one or two more. And yeah, I had to move a, move a little window out of the way. That's okay. And it's gonna kind of condense the right side to give you what you need there. Here's what you're really coming down to. A and not A or B, B or A. Wouldn't matter, I guess. So when would this be true or false or what describes it? And last but not least today, we've got number four, which is another one of kind of a, a, a lot of moving parts, Boolean expression question. <clears throat> Here's a larger version. And Maggie is right. On these, you need to really count your parentheses so that you work deliberately. This one is um, consider the expression and what would be its equal expression. All right. Here is a little bit more detail about multiple choice related to control structures, if else, for loops, um, and including Boolean. Yeah, that's the last one. So for what value does it not work properly like we saw in the, the car, you know, mini compact, subcompact. Um, that was an example of 4A today. What's an equivalent expression? What best describes it? Under which conditions does it evaluate? one way or another. And then there are two other question types, 1C and 2C, that I, there were only secure questions available in AP Classroom, so we're not showing those. So your teacher could make you a little AP Classroom quiz on 1C questions. Um, and that's where, you know, just ask. Um, I'm sure they would be more than happy your teacher would to make you that um, and assign it, you know, for formative practice. Not a grade, but a learning. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. I think that's it on multiple choice. And now we're heading to AP calendar. Okay. So um, I, I know it said that today we were going to look at um, how to create uh, how to create class methods. And we're going to kind of incorporate that into the, into the free response question um, this time. So um, 
last week we focused specifically on the 2018 free response questions. This week we're going to move ahead a year. We've we've progressed an entire year, and we're going to focus on the 2019 free response questions. And um, just again for some quick review, as of 2019, it's very specifically stated that question number one on the AP exam will be our methods and control structures question. Question two, which we'll get into tomorrow again, will be the class question. Um, question three, which we'll talk about on Wednesday, is the array array list question. And question four, which we'll talk about on Thursday, our last day together. Um, uh, that'll be our 2D array question. So today we're focused on methods and control structures. And kind of, again, kind of going full circle back to the question that popped up from our um, quackback session earlier. Um, notice that for this question, we're given a predefined um, class definition. We, we've got this class called AP Calendar, and it has several predefined methods built into it. Um, and notice some of these methods have parameters that are already built in. So anything that's pre-written in part of this class definition has to stick. We can't change any of it at any point, um, whether it's a method that we're going to end up calling or whether it's a method that we're going to write. We have to keep things exactly the, the way they are. So as we look at, again, I'm going to blow up parts of it so that we can see it a little better. But when we look at the top half of this, um, it contains, uh, our, our AP calendar class contains methods used to calculate information about a calendar, and we're going to write two of these specific methods. So they start out in the class definition by giving us a Boolean method called is leap year that's going to return true if the year I pass in is a leap year and false otherwise. And, um, you know, we've talked in the past about any method that they show us that says implementation not shown. That's a red flag that we're going to use that at some point. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind that that's going to pop up somewhere that we have to be able to use it. We have another static method that's going to return an int called number of leap years, um, where I give it two specific years as parameters, and I have to count the number of leap years between year one and year two inclusive. And that's going to be our part A. That's the method that we're going to write for part A. And then we've got another static method, um, a helper method called first day of year that's going to return a zero, a, a numeric value to represent the first day of the year, where zero represents a Sunday, one is a Monday, and so on all the way up to Saturday. So if the first day of the year happened to be a Tuesday, then this method would recall uh, would return the number two. Okay. Um, as we look at, oh, I forgot I had my little arrows. As we look at the bottom half, I've got two more methods to look at. We've got a helper method called day of year. There we go. I'll remember this time. We've got a helper method called day of year that if I pass in a month, a day, and a year, it'll tell us what numeric day of the year that specific day is. So if I pass in January 2nd of 2021, well, January 2nd is the second day of the year it should return to. Um, if I pass in February 1st of 2021, well, that is the 32nd day of the year because there are 31 days in January. So, so day of year, February 2nd, 2021 would return the numeric value 32. And then we also have this method called day of week where I pass in a month, a day, and a year, and it tells me which specific day of the week it was by returning the same numeric value that we had before. Zero is Sunday, one is Monday, and so on, up to the point where six is Saturday. So we have our helper methods in there that we're going to end up calling. And notice that it says there may be some other instance variables and constructors and other things not shown. Um, so we can assume that everything is constructed appropriately and everything's where it should be. Okay. So let's kind of break this down a little bit. Um, you know, when we when we talked earlier, when we were in our, our quack back form um, and we were talking about responses, we said that anything that's pre-written, we have to use exactly what's there. Well, the other kind of key thing to look for is anything where this font, this courier new font is used. So they're telling us we have a specific static method called number of leap years that we absolutely have to use number of leap years. I can't abbreviate it. I can't call it N-O-L-Y and, you know, shorten things. And it returns the number of leap years between year one and year two. And notice that year one and year two are in a different font. So again, those are locked in place. We have to use them. Um, in order to calculate this value, a helper method is provided for you. And it does specifically tell us that we have to use is leap year appropriately to receive full credit. So if we go through and we try and rewrite our own little algorithm to determine whether something's a, a leap year, that's great that you know how to do that. But part of the requirement is, of this problem is knowing how to use already provided methods, how to use things that are already there and call them so we're writing our code as efficiently as possible. And then we have our method header. So let's go out and we'll take a look at the point values for this question, OK? Um, Every, as, as we said last week, every question is worth nine points. So part A of this question is worth our five points. Um, we have to make sure that we're counting something. So anytime we count something, we always have to make sure we initialize a counter, some numeric variable. 
um, and set it equal to zero to start. Um, oh, and I'm going to put a little note up here in a second about beware the question specific penalties. Maggie's uh, helping us out a little bit. Um, we have to leap through each necessary year in the range. So they're giving us year one and year two, and we have to make sure we look at every year in between, including those two. We have to call is leap year on some valid year in the range, and we uh, on the in the range, and we have to update the count based on the result of calling is leap year. So if is leap year returns true, we update our counter, and if it's false, we don't. And finally, we have to return the count of leap years. And occasionally in these questions, you'll see a question specific penalty, and this question included a question specific penalty. The question specific penalty is that if you use this dot to call a static method. And, and you'll notice that when you go back and look at the class definition that all of the methods in this class are static methods, there's a one point penalty. Okay, so I just want to address that real quick. Um, there are two types of methods. There are instance methods that relate specifically to the instance of a class. And there are static methods which are assigned to the class. So they aren't assigned to a specific instance. The purpose of this dot is to, um, is to uh, reference the current object as the object when I call an instance method. Um, so if a method is not static and I say this dot whatever, that means I'm calling the method for this specific object that I'm already calling it from, okay? Um, if I don't use this dot, or I should say if I'm calling a static method, I can't use this dot because I can't reference a static method to a specific object. And that's the purpose of what this dot does. Um, I'm just going to say this, and Mrs. Westerlin, yeah, we uh, I'll, I'll, grab your, I'll grab your opinion here too. Um, I would say that if your teacher has shown you how to use this dot appropriately and you feel comfortable with it, you are welcome to use this dot when writing methods to call another instance method in the same class, okay? But if your teacher hasn't had a chance to cover this dot and you don't feel comfortable with this dot, then I would avoid using it in this context because... Um, when I'm writing a method inside a class that's going to call other methods within the same class, instance met methods work fine without this dot and static methods work fine without this dot. So I would, I would avoid it unless you're really comfortable knowing how to use it appropriately when writing methods and calling other methods in the class. Yeah, and it is included in the course and exam description, the use of this, but you're not required to use this on free response. Um, I mean, we've not seen a question that mandates the use of this. Um, I, I don't expect that you would see that this year. Uh, we have no, you know, historical reference for that in any of yeah. the free response. So yeah. it, again, like he's, like Mr. Schultz said, if you feel really comfortable and you've used done that, we've not done that in my class this year. Um, it's just not something that, that I covered and spend a lot of time on. Um, some of them may do that, um, but I would just say, maybe don't. Um, it, the AP free response, like Mr. Schultz told you last week, is not a time to be cute. It's not a time to be um, fancy or just swim in the pool and in the lanes you're used to. Um, remember my analogy, you know, we're in this swimming pool of Java and swim there. And when you go to the next slide, I want to do one reminder before you go right back. This year, for the first time, those of you taking the exam on May the 6th next week, you're going to have a blank, kind of like a blue book that you'll learn about in college with the border around it. And you'll have to bubble at the top. I'm, I'm about to answer question one and I'm about, I'm about this page has question two. Um, you're going to need to on those pages write part A. And even though the question provided the full method header, public static int number, you're going to need to rewrite that. In past, you haven't had to do that. It was a part of your answer sheet. So, and if you're taking the exam on May the 18th or June the 1st, um, you're gonna have to type this full header that you're given. Um, and you may want to comment at the top, part A. I know last year we kind of practiced with that of doing a comment, part A, you know, slash, slash, part A, slash, slash, part B. So um, that's something to prepare for. Um, the, the sample free response answer page is in your resources folder in, your, in the college board folder. So, and again, that's something else your teacher could print for you or you can print it and share it with everybody as well in your group me group. So, um, you know, whatever it is that you do, um, just kind of be prepared for that. Okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. 
Sorry. Back no, to you're normal fine. programming. No, that's, no, that's great, great advice. Make, make sure, I mean, absolutely, as you're practicing these questions, make sure you're practicing putting them on the actual answer sheet so that you're comfortable with it when the time comes. So yeah, that's, that's definitely something great to consider. So, okay, so here is a sample solution. And, you know, we've talked about the fact in the past that the methods and control structures question typically focuses on units one through four. So um, in the CED, that again, you can reference on, uh, it's, it's in our shared folder and you can also find it on AP Classroom, um, AP Central, I always say the wrong one. Um, when you go out and look at units one through four, units one through four have to do with creating variables, um, calling specific methods from, from pre-existing objects using the math class, um, arithmetic operations, con control statements, you know, our if statements and if else statements, our for loops, while loops. So all of those things are the things that are kind of the focus of typically of a free response question number one. So, so here's an example solution for our number of leap years. And think about what we said we needed to do. We need to initialize a variable to count. We need to iterate through all of the years from year one up to and including year two. We need to appropriately call is leap year on a specific uh, on a specific year in that range. We need to increment our counter based on the result of is leap year, and we need to return the count. So if you look, all of those pieces are here, and they're sequenced exactly the right way to pull this off. We initialize our numeric variable first. We loop through each of the necessary years in the range. So we start our loop control variable y at year one, and we loop as long as y is less than or equal to year two. Um, and I'm going to throw this in as a little extra um, because I've caught a couple of, of at, I mean, still at this stage in the game, a couple of my, my AP students will make this mistake just because they're in a hurry when they're writing things on paper during a practice question. They'll accidentally think of this as not, you know, when do I continue? They think of this as the terminating statement. Why, you know, when do I stop? And they'll accidentally get the logic backwards. So they'll put Y is greater than year two because we're going to stop technically when y is greater than year two but but this isn't a you know loop until this is a loop while we're going to loop continue to loop while y is less than or equal to year two so make sure you're thinking about the correct logic as you put your for loop and your while loops together um let's see we're going to call is leap year on a valid year in the range so y is always going to be somewhere between year one and year two and so we're calling is leap year on a valid year we're updating our, updating our count based on a result of calling is leap year. So if is leap year returns true, um, we can increment our count. And um, I'm going to add this too, because this just popped into my head. There were a couple of students, and we didn't add it to our questions at the beginning, but there were a couple of students that, that quacked us back and asked if you're allowed to say is leap year parentheses y equal equal true. Can you set it up as a Boolean expression using equal equal? And yes, you absolutely can. Um, there was a question, a free response, the free response question we did on Thursday, there was a not with a Boolean expression that was kind of like this. And they asked if you could say, you know, whatever the, the method call was equal, equal false. And yes, you are permitted to do that. Um, and then we return the count of leap years. So we have everything we need for part A. Part A is looking pretty good. Okay. All right. And then if we move on to part B, part B gets a little more involved and you can always tell it's more involved because there's no, there's more that you have to read. So in the static method day of week, we're going to return an integer value representing the day of the week for the given day, where again, zero denotes Sunday and one is Monday and all the way up to six being Saturday. So they give us a couple of examples. If um, So for example, 2019 began on a Tuesday and January 5th was the fifth day of 2019. So as a result, January 5th fell on a Saturday. And if I were to call day of week, January you know, 1, 5, 2019, it would return six because six is our numeric value for Saturday. And then as another example, January 10th is the 10th day of 2019. Um, as a result, January 10th fell on a Thursday. So day of week 1, 10, 2019 would return four. And it specifically tells us that, again, we've got a couple of helper methods to help us out with this. We've got a method that's going to tell us what the first day of the year is. If I give it a specific year, it'll return that integer value that tells us what day of the week that year began on. And we also have a day of year that if I give it a month, day, and year, it'll return in where in represents the nth day of the year. So like I said, Day of year, February 1st of 2021 would return 32 because February 1st is the 32nd day of the year, okay? So um, so Maggie's asking, how would this work? So we have to kind of picture in our heads how this, how this calculation is gonna work for us. So let's look at the calendar for January of 2021. 
And let's say we specifically want to find the day of week for January 7th of 2021. How would we do that given the information that we've got and the methods that we have that we can use? So step one is going to be to say, okay, January 1st was a Friday. And we know that because if I call day of year 2021, it's going to return five. So that's, that's a given for us. We can call first day of year 2021 and it will return five for us to tell us the first day of 2021 was a Friday. Step two is we want to look at the date that we've got, January 7th, um, which is the seventh day of the year. And we know that that day of year 1-7-2021 is going to return seven. So here's where the calculation part comes in. I know that January 7th is the seventh day of the year, but we have to start counting at five because the first day of the year is a Friday, which is five. So we're going to calculate the value of the day of the week like this. We're going to take the first day plus the number of days to get to the current day that we're looking at. And we have to subtract one to make sure we get the correct value that we're looking for. So in other words, I can look at this and I can see that if I start counting at five and I count up to the seventh day, I have to subtract one because really the seventh day of the year is gonna give us a total count of 11 if I start counting at five, okay? And then what we can do is we can take that sum that we found and we can go modulo seven to find out what the remainder is. And we know that if I take 11 modulo seven, I'm gonna get four, which is a Thursday. So that's the algorithm we're gonna use, the little calculation we're gonna to use to figure out what day of the year, uh, what day of the week a specific year falls on. And we can use that for any day of the year, any of the 365 days, and this little calculation will work for us. Okay, so when we look at the point values, we already said that part A was worth five points, part B is gonna be worth four points. We have to make sure we're calling our two static methods, first day of year and day of year. So that, that accounts for two of the points. We have to do our calculation correctly and we have to return a calculated value. And again, Maggie's gonna remind us, be aware of question specific penalties. These are all static methods. So if I use this dot by accident, thinking that I'm referring to this specific object when I call my static method, we'll lose a point for that. Um, and the one thing I should point out about question specific penalties are things like, um, you know, the, the, the uh, penalty that I talked about where if you write um, extraneous code that causes a side effect, you only lose that once per question. So if I do something, if I accidentally write system that out dot print line in part A, and then I write system that out dot uh, system that out dot print line in part B, that's only a one point penalty, even though I did it in both places. Um, if I call all of these methods in both part A and part B with this dot, that's only a one point penalty. I wouldn't lose a penalty for both parts. It's just a one, one point penalty for the whole question part A and point B combined, uh, part B combined. So, so I wanted to make sure I was being clear on that too. Okay, so as we look through, um, oh, and there are our static methods we have to be careful about. So here's our code for this, and it's fairly straightforward. You know, we find the first day of the year, um, so we call first day of year and we assign that to an int variable. Um, we call day of year and we assign that to an, um, an int variable. And then we do our calculation. We said we were going to do the start day plus the nth day minus one. And we were going to take that sum modulo seven. So we're calculating the value represented by the day of the week. That's our return day. And then we're going to return the calculated value. So, so this one, part B, was really just those four lines of code. That's it. Um, and depending on how you write it, you might even be able to write it with fewer lines of code than that. Okay, so Ooh, but you had to response question. Parse through all of that, um, kind of figuring out the calendar work. So, yeah. Fun stuff. Yeah, so here is our Quackback form. You've got a few more days to send us questions or feedback or um, whatever you want to send us, your line of code telling us um, where you are in our objects um, of CSA 2021 review um, or whatever the class is called. I know I've said it a couple of ways, but um, now what are you taking away today? I've got a few things to talk to you about. Um, so perk your ears up a little bit. Um, remember that AP Daily and AP Classroom are where your resources live um, in terms of video resources and the resources that your teacher can um, assigned to you for summative assessment sometimes, but mostly formative assessment. Um, mostly the purpose of AP Classroom is to let you practice on those multiple choice questions to see um, what you understand and what you know and, and how the questions um, 
are presented by skill type. All right, and then the next thing, um, loops and conditionals are um, the building blocks of the algorithms that we write. So you've got to be prepared um, to use for loops, while loops, and selection appropriately. Um, and you may have noticed, and Mr. Schultz probably didn't even know he said it, but while you were talking about part A today, um, you essentially also kind of presented it, um, or I could see it in my head as a while loop, um, you know, with the selection oh, inside, yeah, you know, absolutely. instead of doing the four um, why, you know, less than or equal to year two, um, it could be while um, something. So your code does not have to match the perfect, you know, answer that's presented on AP Central, um, but it has to be, you know, valid Java code. All right, and then um, the next one, prepare for free response one um, as this type of question, methods and control structures. And I've, I've made an, a new little chart for y'all to, to use as a resource as that will be helpful. So tomorrow we're going to question two um, and we're also gonna talk first about digital exams. So if you are taking digital exam administration two or three on May, I've got to look down, May the 18th and June the 1st, um, tomorrow's bit of the day is all about you and what is particular to your exam and you practicing and you getting your machine and your equipment ready and um, who you might communicate with to make sure that all your, you know, what is it, I's are dotted and T's are crossed to be ready for your exam day. So that be the bit. We're going to talk about a ducks themed case study and um, rubber duck objects and all kinds of fun things. And then we're gonna look at step tracker and of course questions. And then our resources folder, we've got um, a new addition there and I'll put, when we get finished today, I'll put my, my vocabulary concept um, list uh, maybe, or maybe I'll put it tomorrow. Um, I don't wanna overwhelm y'all. So maybe one new thing a day is, is good. Um, so in no particular folder, this is just in the outer main resources folder at the bottom. So underneath, you know, folder zero, one, two, three, you'll see a, I think it's a Google doc. Um, so you can save it and make it your own. But what I did is I went through um, over the weekend and I looked through all the questions all the way back to 2004. And I categorized them by question type one, methods and control structures, two, three, and four, y'all can read. So you can see that. But I do want to point out, um, even though I've typed it and it's yellow and red, I, I feel obligated to say it. Some of the released questions involved the use of an interface. And I've put a, a yellow highlight with an asterisk by those. You still can study those questions, but just you will not have to implement an interface. You may not even know what that is yet. Um, you'll learn about that in college. Um, you know, it's it's a, a different type of, of class that can be used, you know, in a project. So, um, you know, I guess for the purposes of reviewing these questions, you can kind of ignore that and think about the role that that seems to play in the answer. If you want to look at it that way, um, we looked at code word checker that had an interface and Mr. Schultz kind of reworked it where um, it it behaved just the same without having to 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 call on that. That thing that it that it um, implemented. So there's some of those um, and it hopefully I didn't miss any. It does go on to two pages. So um, you'll notice when you open it that the column for free response question three is much longer than the other columns. So you have lots of examples of array and array list questions. In the past, the questions were not divided by type. So there were many years where there were multiple array or array list questions on the exam. And that's why that column is so much longer. Um, you won't see that this year. You're going to see them in this way. Um, many of these are great. Um, you can print this, you know, look at the ones that you want to, the names that are attractive to you. I don't know. Um, I know last year we talked about um, Horse Barn one time on, on AP Review. That's a great question. There Horse are so many Barn good is questions a good one. on here. The Robot's a good one. Um, Cookie order is a really clean, good question. Number cube, we went over that one one day last year. Um, it's a fair-sided cube that many of you have probably rolled before in playing games. Um, also linked in the, the exam page link and the past question link. So, um, but you could find those on AP Central. So um, do as much as you can do, but obviously, you know, 
divide up your time with your other AP courses as well. Um, so that's a new resource for you. And um, let me know what you think about it. Um, anyway, I think that's it for today. I, I don't know if that's I missed anything. I hope not. If we did, we'll pick it up tomorrow. Yep. Um, happy Monday. Yep. Everybody have a great Monday and thanks for joining us and we'll see you back here soon.